who's not. Use plain language for your lockdown. We promote this and promote it and promote it. On the medical side, we see this a lot in the medical community. They like to use codes. They like to use colors for code words. We don't. We like to keep everything simple. Just say lockdown is what we recommend. If your business says we're going into lockdown, 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 I don't care where you are in America. If you hear the word we're going into lockdown in your business today, you know something bad's wrong. That that's not the normal thing you would say. But whatever you do use, keep it very simple. Exit signs. By fire code, any public building in common areas must have exit signs where you can see how to get out of that building. They can be life-saving. Uh, not only in where you work, but this can also apply if you're out shopping, at your workplace, hotels, nightclubs, anywhere. If you're in a public area that's open to the public, they have to have exit signs posted. So if you see an exit sign, that means that is an unimpeded exit out of that building. Here's the main reason we're bringing that up. Is humans are creatures of habit. How many of you go to work the same way every day? How many of you, when you go to your workstation at your workplace, you go down the same hall through the same door every time? Guess what you probably do when you leave? You go the exact same way. When you go places, you need to be looking for escape routes. And you don't need to just have one, you need to have your alternate. Because what you're going to do is you're going to go to that normal way, what you always do. But that not, may not be available to you. Some of you may not have heard of this, but this is the uh, Station Nightclub in Rhode Island. In 2003, they had a horrific fire at this nightclub. It was when the, the band Great White was playing. By show of hands, has anybody heard of this? Oh wow, what? Well here's the point I'm making out of it, so I won't go into it as, as much depth. It sounds like most of you are familiar with it. That's the front entrance. If you notice here is a very large area of big plate glass windows. This was the stage area, which is here. And they had pyrotechnics during, during their, uh, while they were playing. This was a very old building, very old draperies. The sparks hit the draperies and everything was consumed in fire really quickly. What killed a lot of people at this club was smoke inhalation. The problem was this, human instinct. When they had to get out of that building, what did everybody do? They went straight back to the front door that they came in. You can't see it very well. The reason why you see these big numbers here, 31 people lay here and die trying to get out that front door. 18 here, 9 here, there's a bunch of other numbers here, here, here. Almost 100 people lost their lives at this nightclub. Guess what? They funneled here because they had no, no plan. They, didn't, they weren't prepared for an alternate escape route. Another fire code exit, another fire code exit, another fire code exit, another fire code exit where the fire started. Huge plate glass windows across the front of the building that could have been busted and got out. That's why you need an alternate escape route because they follow their human instinct. They made themselves like sand in an hourglass and they couldn't get out. This is a business community. I would assume a lot of you travel. Be honest, when you go to a hotel, do you pay any attention to the fire exits? Or are you going to be one of these that goes off in the middle of the night, you have an old something moment, and you have to try to figure out how to get out of there? Start paying attention to these things. They're very important. Other things to keep in mind on the run aspect is, and I'll go quickly on this because it was touched in the video, when you're leaving the building, we're coming. I promise you, we're on our way. Last year in 2017, the Somerset Police Department had an average response time for non-emergency and emergency of three minutes and 17 seconds. That is very good, and here's how I'll prove that. National non-emergency, I'm sorry, national emergency response time for this country, 10 to 12 minutes. Non-emergency, 12 to 18. So we have a very good response time here for you, 
the three minutes and 19 seconds fighting for life is still a long time. But what you want to keep in mind, when you're exiting a building, we don't know who the shooter is. We've already told you it can be anyone, and they can look any way. When you come out, we want to see your hands. We are looking for your hands, and we're looking to make sure there's not a gun in your hands. Now, common sense, you can't run. If you ever did, haven't done it, try it. Put your hands straight up in the air and see how fast you can run. It, it's very awkward. So yes, you can bring your hands down here to where we can still see your hands, but you can move. I've seen other companies teach this, hands up behind your head. We don't like that because I'm just as apt to have a gun behind my head as I am behind my back. We want to see your hands. When we're arriving, do not grab onto us. Do not touch us. We're not there to have a social moment, tea and crumpets. We're there to get to the shooter. We're going to be probably as stressed as you are. And remember, we don't know who the bad guy is. So just move out of our way and let us do what we got to do. The other big thing, the last big point on the run aspect is this. Get down, stay down. Remember what your statistic was? You're 100% likely to get shot if you stay there unless somebody shoots you. There have been studies conducted that with the run aspect to this program, you are 90% less likely to get shot if you run out of the building. That's huge odds. You went from 100% likely getting shot to 10%. I don't have to go to Vegas to figure out that's good odds, people. That, that's excellent. We're now going to move into the lockdown aspect. Lockdown or higher. We call it run high five, but that goes back into the whole lockdown. This is part of the get down, stay down aspect. Uh, if you lock down, you hear gunshot, you see a photo here of some people using office furniture to barricade a door. We are not looking for you to make this door where you cannot penetrate it in a week. We are wanting you to make it quickly, uh, as hard as you can, for that person to get in that room. We like to call it hurdles. The more hurdles you use for that person to get to you, the more time, that three minutes and 18 seconds, I've got there to get to you before they get to you, okay? So we want you to barricade it as best you can. And I'm gonna give you some examples on that in just a second. But you wanna spread out in the room. As you see these people here, they're not standing directly behind the door. The obvious answer is why you don't wanna do that. Occasionally these gun gunmen do shoot through doors. Uh, Virginia Tech, there was a professor and a student barricaded the door with their bodies. They saved 20-something students' lives by doing that, but the shooter did shoot through the door and killed them. So you want to be off to the sides of the door. You also don't want to be huddled up into a tight little group because if that bad guy does come in this room, when he does, we want to be able to fight, and I'll explain that more when we get there. Being huddled up and making it an easy target for him is not what we want. Why you got the door barricaded? Uh, you want to be looking for your alternative escape routes. Back to the nightclub, somebody went to the front door and couldn't get out, they should have been looking for other ways. They should have busted out those front windows and got right out. Or you need to look for other exits. You know your workplace. If you have a second story exit, or I'm sorry, a second story business, sometimes you have a window on the second story that goes to another rooftop. You may want to be prepared to knock that glass out, get on that roof, and go to the edge of the roof. You may have a uh, folding ladder there for your employees that they can lower down to the ground and escape by running across the roof. Back up to the barricade part, I forgot to mention locking the doors and lights. In schools, we do recommend turning off the lights for this reason. We want the bad guy to not know if there's anybody in that room or not. Sandy Hook, one of the teachers did it correctly. They barricaded the door, they turned out the lights. He went past, right past that room to a room that the door was open and the lights was on. That's the purpose of turning off the lights is we don't want to know if you're in there or not. We want it to be an unknown factor. But keep in mind, at your workplace, if you're in an office area, do you have windows or not? Because there's a big difference in turning out the lights in a room with windows versus a room with none. Because you're talking about zero visibility with no windows. In the fight aspect, when we get to that, the reason why I'm bringing up the lights, if you're getting ready to fight and there's 10 of you in there, unfortunately, you guys at the bank are just likely to hit George as you are the bad guy if it's that dark. So you need to be thinking about that. And we'll, we'll touch on that in the fight aspect. 
Do not open the door for anyone. Anyone. We keep saying this in school. Because you probably don't know who the shooter is. It could be somebody that got mad that day. Somebody you usually work with and they're there killing other work, uh, your co-workers. If you have no other way of figuring out, call 911 and ask them, is there police officers at the door? We can use our radios to verify with them that we're at your door. So don't open that door until you know you're safe to do so. First aid supplies are always good to keep at a workplace for these type of things. And we already touched on don't uh, place anyone behind the door. Back to the second story at the Virginia Tech shooting. It's called a hang and drop. I don't know if there's some volunteers in here, if y'all touch on that much in fire training. But through, through Virginia Tech, we learned something. 20 something, around 24 stu students survived a second story hang and drop. What I mean by that is they busted out their class window. They went to the window. They lowered themselves out of the window as low as they could, and then they let go and dropped to the ground. Not one student had a broken ankle, broke knee, broke anything. They all survived and walked away. Now, obviously, there's factors there. Not everybody may get that lovely, but you do have a high probability of surviving a 30-foot drop or less. Um, now, most people are saying, I'm not going out the window. You can sit there and wait and see if it gets through the door or not, and that's up to you. What we'll do in high stress situations, the human body is hard to say. Folks look at the Twin Towers. You've seen people coming out of those windows with no other choice. So never count yourself out on what you may do. On lockdowns with this new program, 60% of shooting incidences are ended by you folks by co-workers, by students, by teachers, before we ever show up. That's why we will really push this program. I'm gonna show you a few photos. Now that's a barricaded door. This was a classroom in Florida. If you remember this year, we had two nationally known shootings in Florida. The first one, this wasn't it. They were prepared, but they wasn't this prepared. When they had the second shooting in Florida, students in a classroom did this in under a minute. They put everything out because the teachers went back and explained it to the students what to do. You guys are expected to go back to your facilities and teach your businesses what to do. So if you're prepared, you can do a whole lot in a very short amount of time. This is just another example. Just about everybody here, if you're a local business, has computer cords, electric cords, maybe you have some type of rope in your facility. This is a door that does not have an interior lock. You can do something as simple as tying off to the door handle and coming off to the side of that and securing it and pulling on that rope or that cable, and you can make that door extremely difficult to get through. Now, they may push it in an inch or two, and it's going to shut back. We're looking for seconds. Every second you give us buying time helps us get to you. This is another example. This one here is called, we call it a scissor hinge. A lot of your automatic closing doors have that. The scissor hinge works like this. For that door to open, that hinge has to expand. Right? So, if the, if the hinge is closed, and you take rope, a belt or anything else and tie off that hinge it can't expand it. therefore the door can open that's just another little quick trick of the trade also yeah, also something as simple as a 50 cent door stop that blows anything like that can make a door harder to get through now we're going to move on into the five aspect We use the word fight, but it, what we're really looking for is disrupt. When we say fight, we don't mean literally punch them in the mouth. It can be many things to disrupt them. This acronym here referred to as the OODLU. That is an acronym that was used by the United States Air Force. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, John Boyd of the Air Force put this together. 
He was training fighter pilots. And the way he came up with that was this. They were trying to figure out how to get the advantage against their adversary. What they learned was we all kind of have a natural way of thinking. No matter what you're doing in life, you are observing, you're orientating, you're deciding what to do, and then you're acting in anything you do. If I decide to move back here and you're observing me, you're orientating yourself to what I'm doing, you are deciding if you want to do anything or not, and then if I was to run at you real quickly, you would then act. The point of this, our minds work like that. That's how our thinking goes. What he wanted them to understand is we want our opponent, the bad guy, to react to our action. If he's coming in the room and you do something to disrupt him, to fight, and he's coming in the room and he's observing, he's orientating, he's deciding, and before he acts, you take, well, it took my prop from him. You take the stapler off your desk and you fling it at his head. What do you think he's going to do? Natural human instinct is he's going to react. He's going to flinch. He's going to do something. Now, I'm not saying that's going to give you minutes, but that's going to give you a few seconds of opportunity to then act. He's then reacting to you. And that's the whole point of the Lulu. You observe, orient, decide, and act. If we disrupt his thinking, then he's reacting to you, and it puts you at the advantage. Because he's then reacting to you. I'll give you a quick example. A little boy named Jesse, who was a hero at Sandy Hook Elementary. The gunman came in their classroom. He had a malfunction with his weapon, and he began trying to fix it. Little Jesse, just a little bitty boy, saw what was occurring and stood up and went, Run! 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 Guess what his classmates did? They got up and they ran out of the room. He saved every one of their lives by doing that. The gunman, he didn't know what to do. He stood there and was trying to fix his gun real quick, and they all went out of the room. Little Jesse saved a lot of lives by interrupting his little loop, also interrupting those children's little loop, and making them do something in react. That's the point. One people, some people ask, well, how did he get by them? What's your tunnel vision do? Natural tunnel, I'm sorry, your natural vision is about 120 degrees. High stress situation, you get tunnel vision. It goes down to about two to four degrees. That makes it very easy for somebody to get by you. Most people ask questions about this, and, and I'm not going to get into uh, a lot of debate on it, or a lot of explanation. It's in a law class. Got some great attorneys and judge here tonight. But you do have a legal right to protect yourself and to protect the life of other people in this situation. I can't get into, we can what if it to death, what if he does this, what if he does that. Just the basic Kentucky law does state you have a legal right to protect your life and to protect the life of others from death. Okay? I'm just going to keep it real simple. We can clarify for you more early or later, and I'm going to go into a lot of explanation with the group. Another key point in the disruption in the fight is another story of a football coach at a high school. The shooter came into the, the, the I'm sorry, the gym. He opened up fire on the students. The big burly football coach stood up and said, Stop! Stop! You know what that kid did? He dropped his gun and ran out of school. The football coach chased him over a mile until he finally gave up and surrendered to the police. And they said, why didn't you drop your gun and run out of school like that? He says, because so so and so screamed at me. And I didn't know what to do. He didn't know what to do. We've had other instances in schools where students have just given up because teachers and staff screamed at them to stop. Disrupting can be more than actually fighting. It can be more than fleeing things at their head. It can be lots of things. But you do want to use devices to disrupt them and disorient them. Another good example of a good weapon in an office building is a fire extinguisher. You got your door barricaded and they come in there, you can blind them and then hit them with it. Then run out. 
It's one of the best tools you got. I'll give you another little quick uh, uh, trick of the trade. It's cheap. Wasp spray. Have you ever used wasp spray? It'll shoot 20 or 30 feet. You think it feels good in your face or in your eyes? No. There's all kinds of tricks. Uh, I've heard some of the schools tell me, well, this is a school. I can't really have a weapon, but we have PE. I can probably put a baseball bat behind the door, can I? Well, I'm not going to tell you to violate any of your administration or your business's policies, but sometimes you got to think outside the box. Weapons can be anything. But a very important part of this in the fight aspect, if you disrupt this person, you disorientate them, you hit them, you subdue them, and they drop the gun, do you think we want you to pick up the gun? No, we do not want you to pick up that weapon. You might kick it out of the way, but guess what? We don't want to show up and you be the one with the gun in your hand. Because remember, we don't know who the shooter is. Simple tricks you can do is you can kick it out of the way. If you've got co-workers that's getting on top of this person to subdue them, kick the gun out of the way. Just take a trash can, turn it upside down, put it over top of the gun. The gun's out of view, no one can touch it, sit there and hold that trash can. Or, if this person's completely unconscious or whatever, if you're just getting out of there, you can always put the gun in the wastebasket and walk out with your wastebasket. I don't think the police have ever shot anybody for carrying a wastebasket. That's probably pretty safe. But we do not want you coming out of that building with a gun in your hand. Because it's going to be a very high stress situation for us and you at that point. Well, this is looking better than I thought because I'm ahead of myself. A little bit of a summarization before we finish up. Run, hide, fight. It's not complicated. The three options you have. Things to keep in mind with this program is remember it's simple for purpose and by design. It's not that the people that designed this couldn't think of anything better. It's something that you can easily remember and you can, anyone can do it. The next best point of it is you can do it anywhere. You can go home and teach your children about this. And folks, I'll tell you this, don't dismiss the fact of thinking that you can't talk to your kids about this. Kids are probably more resilient than you give them credit for, and there's plenty of ways you can discuss it with them. You can just make it as simple as this. If a bad man shows up at your school and he has a gun, what are you going to do? And you know what? They probably know more about it than you do. So have that conversation with them. Something that we advocate for schools, when we first started teaching this program nationally, the run aspect, scared schools to death because what they thought was what am I going to do when a parent shows up and they want to know where their child is and we don't know are we going to be liable are we going to get sued and I gave them a really quick simple answer to this this is blunt and to the point but I'm sorry I'm a policeman and that's how we work would you rather show up at that school and someone look at you and say yeah I know where your child is he's laying there under his desk and he's being killed because we wouldn't let him out of that room or would you rather hear well, I don't know where he is right now, but the police are going to help look for him. We're sure he'll show up. We know he's not in school right now, but we'll find him. As a parent, I would much rather have that answered, and I would understand that, than, than know the fact that my kids were held in a classroom and they couldn't get out. Now, to be fair, with schools, and that being said, it varies with school and age of the child. Okay? We do not teach fighting in elementary school grades. Those children can't fight. Middle schoolers, high schoolers, they can help teachers do a lot. <coughs> running in elementary, there's a big difference in middle school and a high school. High school are running off. They can probably take care of themselves for quite a few hours. Elementaries, a lot of that depends on their location to the exit. It's real hard, can you imagine, trying to take 35-year-olds and get them to run out of school. It'd be like trying to herd cats. It's real impossible to do. But if they're next to a door and they can get them out, we do advocate that they do. But if they're not close to an exit and they can't, we still do preach to lockdown, but then it's enhanced lockdown. Look for other exits. Look for your windows. Be prepared to fight. And then if they make entry in the room, fight for all you got. Commit 150%. And if those kids run out of that room at that point, that's fine. 
let them run. Let them save their own life. Your notifications. The most important part of your notification is do not dismiss it like they did in San Bernardino. One other quick little story, I'll tell you this about the lady I interviewed from San Bernardino. She was about five foot tall, but she was a spitfire. She told them after their training, she said, I'm going to kick them and this, and I'm going to do this. That bad guy shows up, don't you worry about it. The husband and wife entered that room where they were having a Christmas party. They began shooting, and guess what she did? She got down and stayed down. Here's the key point, though. She had had this training, and as soon as she got down, she immediately recognized, this isn't right, this doesn't feel right, I've got to do something else. And she did. She got up, and she went out in the back exit of the room, and she lived. So even if your natural instinct is to cower, is to get down, I promise you, after being exposed to this, you're going to know that's not what you need to do, and you're going to react differently. One of the most important points of the Run High Five program is which one do I do? People ask this all the time. Do I run, do I fight, or do I hide? That is determined by the location of the shooter. If it's unknown and you can get out, get out. If this is another person and I'm the shooter and I'm right on top of you, well, you've only got an option of fighting and running at that point. There's no hiding. The location of the shooter determines if you run high to fight. And it's not sequential. This is not you have to run, you have to hide, and then you have to fight. You might run, then your exit's blocked, and then you may hide and barricade. Then he may come in that room and you may fight, and you may run out again. It does not have to be done in any order. It's what's applicable to you with where that shooter is. And the other best part of this program is it can be used literally anywhere. I know there's several people here from churches it doesn't matter if you're at church. It's the same thing. You have three options. Run, hide, or fight. Now something that comes up a lot, and I'll probably close uh, the lecture with this, is people say, well, I have a carry concealed permit. I'm not a bit worried about it. That's good. But carry concealed permits are for self-protection. They are not for the protection of others. Uh, Take your passions in the back. Is it uh, 20 rounds? Yes. 21 feet? Yes. Once? One time? Yes. You got to shoot 20 bullets at 21 feet, 7 yards, one time. And that gives you a carry concealed permit. Do you think that makes you an expert in marksmanship? Probably not. Uh, the church I go to, we've done some measurements there. It's an auditorium of this size, or maybe a little bit larger. This is a huge distance to shoot across. When people are running, you're responsible for every bullet that comes out of your gun. If you shoot an innocent person, you're responsible for that bullet. So, my opinion and the best advice I give you is a carry silver permit is good for an up close and personal self protection. It's not, take, it's not for taking a 40-yard shot across the building or a lobby or a foyer where people may be running across. Police officers train as much as anybody probably in our nation other than the military. You know what our success rate is on hitting in a, in a stressful situation? About 30%. Now, some people laugh when we say that, but you're not taking into account trying to shoot that running deer. We're trying to shoot a target that's fighting against us, and we're moving as well. So it makes it much more difficult. With a Carrick Silverman, you stood still, you shot a target that wasn't moving at only seven yards. There's a huge, huge difference. Ladies and gentlemen, run high five. That's it. Uh, Mr. Clue, if you have the mic. What we're getting ready to do is close. We will open it up to questions. I'm expecting there probably will not be a whole lot of questions because there's a lot of people in here that don't know one another. And we're all shy human beings and we're timid. We usually don't like to talk in front of people we don't know. But we are going to do a Q&A. If you have questions, we'll answer. This, Randall Smith at SomersetPD.com, or you can call our office, is for if this is something you want us to come to your business location and present to your business. This is a very similar uh, presentation to what we normally do for only lecture. 
There is another aspect that we can do in this that does implement three hands-on drills. And what we do is we put your employees through a drill of an actual run drill, a high drill, and a five drill. It probably adds, well, it depends on how many employees you got, but you're probably looking at about another 30 minutes to an hour depending on another, the amount of your employees. So if you are interested in contacting us, I'll tell you this, since we implemented this program in February of this year, counting tonight and the two we have scheduled next week, we have taught 30 different entities in this community now. We have taught churches, we have taught government uh, business, or government entities, we taught businesses, and we taught schools, and we taught medical facilities. This is something for you all. We are doing it to get this information out. We will come teach it, or you will have your people come to us if you want us. And we're not going to come out on your door begging. We've got plenty to do, I promise. Plenty to do. But if you ask and you want this, we'll do everything we can to get this out to the community and to your business. If you'll contact us at Lieutenant Smith's email and number, the way we've done the 30 prior classes is we kind of look at scheduling, first come, first serve, and we'll work you in as quickly as we can. It may take us two weeks, it may take us two months, it may take us six months to get to you, but I promise you, we will come and do it for you. Uh, the video you saw earlier, this is the Department of Homeland Security's website. If you don't want to write it down, just remember the Department of Homeland Security. They are a great resource for free information for public uh, active shooter response. That's where the five minute video came from that you all watched tonight. It's a good summarization. But they have, they have employee handouts that you can print off. They've got posters you can print off. They've got the information in Spanish. I don't know if they have it in any other language. I know they have it in Spanish. And they do update this information frequently. The video we played tonight, it's probably the fourth video I've seen them do over the last 10 years. So they do continue to update this program. So if you want to go there when you get back to work, look at the Department of Homeland Security. Um, that's a great resource for your business. Or like I said, you can contact us as well. I am now going to open up to questions and we will try to give you an answer. If you will raise your hand, if you have a question, we'll bring a mic to you. If you don't want to speak, we got one down front. If you don't want to speak to the mic, we will uh, we'll take your question. We just want to say it on the mic so everybody can hear it in the room. And if you have a question and you do not want to make it public, myself or any of my staff, we will stay here tonight until you are done with questions. So you can ask us as much as you want. I've not went back on my word on that yet, but if you're here to test me, hopefully we won't be here to midnight. So go, ahead. Have time. So go ahead, sir. Uh, earlier when you were talking about new simple language, yes, sir. you made a very good point that you yelled, you yelled out lockdown three times. Correct. I want to explain why. We want to make sure it's easily heard by everyone in your building, and even if there's noise and disruption in your facility, we want to make sure that gives you three chances to hear. Just like here at Somerset High School, when they do their typical PA announcements, they have a very difficult time hearing that in the gymnasium. So other areas in your workplace may be the same way. We just want to give you a good chance. Maybe you're on the phone, and in that time it's repeated, you've got off the phone and you can hear it better. That, that's the main purpose of uh, repeating it. Yes, sir. How effective would you consider uh, panic buttons that some of the businesses and, and other places may have in getting communication to you as opposed to dialing 911? What we would recommend in that is first, preservation of life. Whichever saves your life first. If you do not have time to hit that button and you got to go, uh, receptionists, uh, people at front desk of businesses, lots of times they have buttons. I'll bring up that a good point, Mr. Hall. I won't say who, because it sounds bad, but I know a lady that went through one of my classes. And I brought up to her, I said, how many times do I think I've, I've came in your place when I walked in, you were doing this with your cell phone? You are missing your notification because you are looking at your phone 
instead of looking at the door. Where she works is a big, large plate glass area, large glass doors. She can see somebody coming in that building probably 10 seconds before they ever got to the door if you're paying attention. Now, I'm not saying that to be a crude jerk. I know we all look at our phones occasionally when we do things, but it's something to think about. But first, what saves your life? If you got time to hit the button, hit the button. The other thing, I think the video just on it a little bit, was a lot of people want to panic and immediately call 911. If you're trying to call 911 and you get killed, you've done, done nothing to help yourself. So get to a safe area and then call 911. Does that answer decently for Okay. Anyone else? Got one over here? We got a physical fitness program coming up in uh, October for employees, so this is going to help get Captain Carell maybe a little bit loosened up for him. By October, he may be ready to go. <laughs> Unfortunately, we only have one mic, so sorry, it's going to take us a minute to get around to you. Is there a fee for coming to do a class at your place of business? Absolutely not. This is at the expense of uh, Somerset Police Department in the city of Somerset. It's a benefit for our community. Any other hands? Got one. Got, okay, we'll just work our way back. Got one here toward the middle. I was just going to make a statement that uh, on the new iPhones, there's an option. If you, you can run and hit this power button. If you cycle the power button five times rapidly, it will dial 911. It will dial 911? Yes. Right. So that, you can run and be clicking the power button. That's an interesting fact I didn't make up. Thank you very much. Uh, now, when it does that, it dials, so then you would be wanted. Then you can talk and move at the same time. Is Kevin, can you say that again? Okay. You can hold it as well. So basically five presses are a hold for five seconds. But that's specific to the iPhone. Okay? We have another one back here? I come from a, a career of teaching children how to hide.